Uh, Jacob has been a, a big blessing to us and a big help to this church over the years, and so he's going to come and do uh, one final teaching, and so please welcome again Jacob Prash. <laughs> Brother John graciously says he recommends everything. We usually agree, but not this time. I don't like any of it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the latest book, should you be so inclined, is called Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scriptures really teach about the rapture and its timing, its sequence and prophetic events. Harpezo, there's a few copies left out there. If you'd like to come with us to Israel, our next Bible study tour of Israel will be in April. Don't worry, don't believe what you see on the news. You're not going to get shot or blown up. You might get shot or blown up in Cleveland, but not in Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> if you go to our website, moriel.org, M-O-R-I-E-L.org, or to um, Jacob Prash Tours, we'd love to have you with us. Uh, in Israel in April. I, of course, lead the tours. I speak Hebrew, etc. And you'll meet together with Israeli believers, Israeli pastors, and so on. And I promise we won't take you to a lot of Latin and Byzantine churches. We'll take you to a lot of archaeological digs where the things really happen, and we'll study the word, word of God. So it is. If you need a fellowship in this area, I'd recommend this one. I also endorse the ministry of my friend, Steve Mitchell. We've been friends for quite some time. He's a good brother and a good preacher. You don't have a church in this. He's in, coming back, I think, today or tomorrow from Hawaii. But uh, if you are in this general Columbus vicinity and you don't have a biblically based fellowship, you'd be more than welcome to worship with our brethren here at this particular one. Okay? I hope to be back again, Lord willing. It is affiliated with our ministry, Moriel, and we absolutely endorse it. Let's continue. The next subject I was asked to address by the elders. The next one, Charming the Snake, Charming the Snake. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 10. In Hebrew, we call Ecclesiastes Chochelet, Chochelet. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. If the serpent bites before you charm it, there's no profit for the charmer. Quite a statement. The book of Ecclesiastes is God's book of philosophy. Paul warns us in Colossians about the vain philosophies of the world. The British, they have beat them in Hobbes. The Greeks had Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. The Dutch had Spinoza. You know, and, uh, you know, the 19th century German rationalists, Nietzsche and, and Hegel. They've all got their own philosophers. Well, God has his book of philosophy. His book of philosophy is Ecclesiastes, Kohelet. God's philosophy is quite simple. In the Vulgate, it says, vanitas vanitatem, omnia vanitas. <laughs> it's all in vain. <laughs> Doesn't matter how rich you get, you're going to end up just as dead as a person who was always broke. <laughs> God's philosophy of life, the world has fallen. Make the best of a bad situation. Love God and keep his commandments. Trust in the kingdom of the Messiah that's coming. If you trust in this place, you're going to be gravely disappointed. In the meantime, get on with it. There's a better world coming. And meanwhile, make the best of a bad thing. But don't trust this place. It is all in vain. You can get educated. 
But there's going to be futility in many books. <laughs> Anybody who is really clever understands that the more they learn, the less they know. <laughs> You're never going to get there this side of kingdom come. And I'm not putting down education. I've been afflicted with that curse myself, unfortunately. <laughs> I had it drummed into me as a kid. <laughs> As you can see, it didn't do me much good. If the snake bites before it is charmed, you got a problem? Come with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 17. Yerbiahu Hanavi. For behold, I'm sending serpents against you, adders, for which there is no charm. They will bite you, declares the Lord. God is going to send snakes to bite a backslidden people. What are these snakes that must be charmed, and what does the charming mean? Look with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 3, I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by craftiness, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The serpent beguiled the woman. Eve is a picture of Israel, and by incorporation, the church. Satan always has two modes of attack if you don't know. The dragon and the serpent. The book of Revelation. The dragon is Satan, the persecutor. The serpent is Satan, the seducer. But the serpent's bite is just as deadly as the dragon. Satan attacks by both spiritual seduction, beguiling, as well as by overt persecutorial attack. In the last days, the dragon and the serpent are cast down to you. The church faces persecution and tremendous spiritual seduction simultaneously. Quite a thing. The serpent beguiled the woman. Happened to Israel, happening to the church. That was Paul's fear for those believers in Corinth. How does it work? Well, let's look at natural women, natural men. I pointed out multiple times, again, you may have heard me say it, that because of the fall of man, we're messed up. <laughs> because of the fall of nature, men have become insensitive and women have become hypersensitive. If a husband and wife get saved, it's usually the wife who gets saved first. Not always, but usually. When a husband and wife pray for direction, it's usually the wife who hears from the Lord first and clearest. Not always, but usually, if she's a believer. If the husband gets saved first, the wife usually, not always, but usually becomes a believer. Water will take the shape of its container. But there are many godly women who have unsaved husbands, and they go through years and decades married to a non-believer. Why is it easier for women to hear from the Lord? Why is it easier for women to get saved? Because men are rendered insensitive by the fall easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. It is a fact. If you are a Christian, your first and foremost counselor will be a praying wife, not a nagging wife. That turns guys off. But a praying wife. Women are more sensitive because men are insensitive due to the fall of man. On the other hand, anything God intends for good the world, the flesh, and the devil will use for evil. And so while it is easier for women to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, it is easier for women to be seduced 
by a counterfeit spirit. Women by nature are much more vulnerable to spiritual seduction. That's why leadership is male. We might say the male antenna is too short. <laughs> it just doesn't pick up the signal. But when it eventually gets it, it's the right one most of the time. <laughs> the female antenna is too long. It can pick up anything, including two contradictory signals at the same time. And somehow, don't ask me to explain it and make sense of it. <laughs> <laughs> Because of the fall, males are reliant on female sensitivity. Women, because of the fall, are reliant on male protection. You understand? We have to understand that. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. If we are not under the protective covering of our husband, as the church, the bride of Christ, we corporately, collectively, are going to be deceived. The serpent beguiles the woman, just like with Israel. The snake bites. That snake must be charmed! It goes back to Genesis 3. Look how Satan beguiled the woman. He subtly distorted what God said. He tried the same thing with the husband, Jesus. Matthew 4 didn't work, for it is also written. He tried the same thing on Jesus. He tried on Eve, but it didn't work. Wouldn't, <laughs> it didn't wash with him. Quite a thing. People who think with their emotions are dangerous. Or put it to you this way. People who replace the leading of the Holy Spirit or who subordinate the Spirit to human intellect are dangerous. But people who think with their emotions and subordinate their intellect to their emotions, <laughs> they're lethal. <laughs> Our intellect has to be subordinated to the Word of God and the leading of the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures for it to be of any use. But when people begin confusing their emotion with their spirit, you've got a problem. They're thinking with their emotions and they think it's spiritual. They become too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. Now, women are more predisposed to this than men. Women are more predisposed to this than men. The church is more predisposed to it than Jesus, obviously. He's not predisposed to it at all. Only, unlike the man you may be married to, he's not insensitive. <laughs> that serpent bites. And if it bites you before it is charmed, you got a problem. Lachesh, in Hebrew. We translate it charm. It is also a word for something that makes one immune to the effect by wearing it. It's a term in Isaiah used for an amulet. But the actual term itself, Lachesh, that we translate charm, means a whispered incantation, a whispered incantation that charms the snake. I was in Mumbai, India one time, and down by the gate of India where the snake charmers were hanging out. <laughs> Have the cobras in the baskets. So the Swami, the dude with the dish towel on his head, gave me the flute. I watched them. Got the thing, playing the flute. I opened uh, 
with their rendition of blue suede shoes and the thing became aggressive. <laughs> I quickly switched to Amazing Grace to calm him down. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter has the photograph. Snake charmers still exist. They still exist in Asia. I've seen them in India. And I, I actually did that. <laughs> They're out there. Yes! Lachesh! If you don't charm the snake before it bites you, you're in trouble. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 20. I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 20. Headdresses, ankle chains, sashes, perfume boxes, amulets. That word amulets is lachishim in Hebrew. Something that can ward off the serpent. It continues. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 3, verse 3. The captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the expert artesian, and the skillful enchanter. That enchanter is the snake charmer in Hebrew. Behold, the Lord of hosts, in verse 1, is going to remove from Jerusalem and Judah both supply and support, the whole supply of bread and the supply of water, the mighty man, the warrior, the judge, the prophet, the diviner and the elder, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, the counselors and the expert artesian, and the skillful enchanter. I'll make lads their princes. When God's judgment falls on a backslidden people who refuse to repent, you'll have unqualified people, lads as their princes. They'll get leaders who are not qualified. God will remove the qualified leaders, including those who know how to charm the snake. The people will become hyper-susceptible to spiritual seduction. From Isaiah, it went through the days of Jeremiah. After Isaiah and Micah, it was Jeremiah's day. And now the Lord says, I'm going to send these snakes, as we read. The Lord will send the snakes. That's frightening. Tell Ahab, I'll put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets, remember? Oh, you want to follow false prophets? I'll send you false prophets. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, in the last days with the dawn of the Antichrist. We deal with it in the book, uh, Shadows of the Beast. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. In Zechariah 11, the Antichrist is called God's mighty agent. I'll send you a seducer. You want false prophets? Oh, I'll get you a false prophet. You want to listen to people who are Proven false prophet. You want to listen to Benny Hinn and to, to, to Copeland and you want to listen to Beth Moore? I'll, I'll get you a false prophet. I'll send you these serpents. Not only will I send you the serpents, the time is going to come when I'm going to remove from you the people who know how to charm those serpents. That's the second word. Lechesh. By in. Lachesh by in. By in is the Hebrew word for distinguishing between. In the New Testament, it is translated from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. 
and some biblical translations correctly, correctly translate discernment of spirits as distinguishing of different kinds of spirits. If you have a Bible that says distinguishing different kinds, it's right. What spirit is this? Is this the Holy Spirit or is it an alien spirit? The fruit of the spirit is self-control. Ekrete in Greek. But you've got this stuff with that tattooed goon and these counterfeit revivals in Toronto and Pensacola and that. People are out of control. It can't possibly be the Holy Spirit. Now that's the kind of discernment we should all have. But then there's a gift of discernment. Where's somebody really at? Where are they coming from? The serpent is subtle. Remember, he quotes scripture convincingly. If you're listening to me, you need to test everything you hear from me by the word of God. You need to ask Jesus by his spirit to show you if what I'm saying is the truth. But some people will have discernment of spirits. They will be able to distinguish. This one is a false prophet, a false teacher. This one is from the Lord. Discernment of spirits. Distinguishing of spirits. A lachesh could be translated just a amulet, a bracelet to ward off wickedness, evil. Lachesh <laughs> bayin. Can you charm the snake? before it bites. No good bolting the door of the proverbial barn after the horse escapes, is there? If you can't charm the snake, it's going to bite you. Not only that, but Jeremiah tells us a time is coming when God is going to send the snakes just like he did in ancient Israel when they were under his judgment, when they wouldn't repent, when they rejected the warnings of Hosea and of Amos and of Joel and of Isaiah and of Jeremiah and Micah. He sent the snakes in judgment before the Babylonian captivity. Before the church, before Babylon the Great, the snakes are coming. They're all over the place. Look with me, please, to Isaiah 26. O oh Lord, they sought thee in distress. They could only whisper a prayer. Thy chastening was upon them. Lachesh, a whispered incantation. Now this is quite a chapter. One of the questions I've been asked many times, and a question that you may have been asked or even asked, how can we enjoy the blessings of heaven, of eternity? Or even the millennium? Knowing that we have unsaved loved ones, perhaps, who didn't accept Christ to our in eternal perdition. How can we enjoy heaven and being with the Lord if we have family, loved ones, who are in hell? A lot of Christians have thought of that. Many people have asked me that. Verse 14, the dead will not live, the departed spirits will not rise. Therefore thou hast punished and destroyed them, thou hast wiped out all remembrance of them. No, they are not annihilated, but the remembrance of them is. We will not know that they ever existed. You understand? We will not know they ever existed. 
long remembrance of them is going to be gone. We won't know they ever existed. It bothers us now. When we have an unsaved loved one who dies outside of Christ, it bothers us now. But we're told that when the Lord comes in Revelation, he'll take away every tear. Well, that includes grieving over the death of unsaved loved ones. In eternity, we won't know there ever was such. They'll know. We will not. Nonetheless, as we read, there's a whisper, an incantation, a lachesh that has some power. Look with me, please, to Numbers 21, verse 6. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so many of the people of Israel died. Because of their idolatry and rebellion, the Lord sent serpents. You want to be seduced into worshiping golden calves? The Lord will send the serpents to bite you. He will allow Satan to be his instrument of judgment. The Lord will allow people to be seduced and deceived like he did with Ahab and his prophets, like he will do in 2 Thessalonians 2, like it says in Zechariah 11. Those who choose false prophets, God will send them false prophets in judgment. He'll send these serpents to bite. However, there was a cure. As the Son of Man was lifted up, as Moses lifted up, the serpent in the wilderness, the nechushtan, from the Hebrew word nechoshet, brass or bronze. Why was Jesus represented by something evil? He who knew no sin became sin. What is going to stop that snake from biting you? It has to be charmed. What is that charm? Lachesh. A whispered incantation. Jesus, please don't let go of me. Jesus, please don't let me be deceived. Don't let me be misled. Don't let me get off the right path of the cross and following you. Jesus, please. If that is not our lachesh, that serpent is going to bite. You may not know a lot of doctrinal theology. You may not have been a Christian very long. But if you have that amulet, if you look at that serpent that was lifted up in the wilderness on the staff, if that is your lachesh, you will be able to charm the snake. The deception will come! But you'll be able to charm the snake. Before my wife was my wife, she was my girlfriend. Before she was my girlfriend, she was somebody I just led to Christ in Jerusalem, Jewish girl. And I led her to the Lord in Jerusalem. And she became my girlfriend, but I lived in New York at the time. She lived in Israel. Fortunately, I made a lot of loot. I could afford to fly back and forth and speak on telephone for hours <laughs> at the time. Then I went into the ministry and went broke. <laughs> And as a young believer, even in Israel, they were there. They were mostly Arabs. She had just been saved a few weeks. The snakes came to the door on Mount Carmel. It was the Jehovah's Witnesses. She didn't know anything. They began telling her Jesus was not God. He was an angel. She didn't know anything. But she just went through this. She doesn't know why. She turned to Hebrews 1. So which of the angels did he say, thy throne, O God, is forever? And the JWs couldn't handle it. She's only been saved a couple of weeks. She didn't know any doctrinal theology. She knew very little beyond second birth. 
etc. But she knew how to charm the snake. Even a new believer can know the lachesh. Can you charm the snake? If you can't charm the snake, I guarantee it's going to bite you. Look with me to Deuteronomy chapter 32, please. They are a nation lacking in counsel. There's no understanding in them. Would that they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern Bayin, their future. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up? Indeed, their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies themselves judge this. For their vine is from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison. Their clusters bitter. Their wine is the venom of serpents and the deadly poison of cobras. A backslidden people, a backslidden church have a different rock than us. Eben Ezra, Eben Ezra, the rock of our help, our Sela, our Petra, that's Jesus. He's our rock, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. They have a different rock. They don't have our rock. We're the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I'll testify to you, I have a burden on my bosom. The Church of Latter-day Saints is true. <laughs> Yeah, your Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. The real Jesus is the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father. You've got a different Jesus. <laughs> As we looked at at the conference, our Jesus said, if anybody says I've returned physically, it's not me. Get away from him. I'm coming back the way I left. Somewhere right now over in the Mass, they say Jesus has just come back physically. The bread and wine were transubstantiated. Jesus is physically present. We worship the Eucharist. It's a different Jesus. They have a different rock. The word faith money preachers really have a different Jesus. The real Jesus said, a servant is not above his master. Pick up your cross and follow me. There Jesus says, you're a king's kid. Blab it and grab it. <laughs> They got a different rock, but they believe it. Why? They don't have the new wine. Their wine is the venom of the serpent. They've been bitten by the snake. They've been spiritually seduced. Look where it ends up. Sodom, Gomorrah. No wonder they're ordaining homosexuals. No wonder you got Tony Campola and these guys caving in on homosexuality. Brian McLaren, the guru of the emergent church, performed the same-sex marriage for his son and his son's husband. And people go listen to that guy. How can they do that? Because the serpent has bit them. That's why. Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 16. Paul first arrives in Europe at Philippi. Been here, fantastic place to visit. It came that as we were going to the place of prayer, which was down by the river, a certain slave girl having a spirit of divination met us who was bringing her masters much profit by fortune-telling. Following after Paul and us, she kept crying out, saying, These men are bond servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming the way of salvation. 
should continue doing this many days. For Paul was greatly annoyed and turned and said, to the spirit, not to her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. It's translated usually spirit of divination. It's the Pythian spirit. Python. The serpent spirit. Now notice the serpent said true things. The serpent said true things about Jesus, about Paul, and about Luke, and kept saying true things. So initially, Paul doesn't say anything. But eventually, we got to deal with this. Because somebody is saying true things, that in itself is not always the proof of the pudding. You don't say anything against them as long as they're telling the truth. But the serpent is cunning. They know how to use truth to seduce people, to get close enough to bite. That requires discernment. Bayin in Hebrew, in Greek, Diaclino is usually the term. It means to investigate in modern Greek, to inquire into it. Just because somebody is saying true things. Well, all right, we don't speak against them if they're saying true things. But why are they saying true things? There are people who will say true things to ingratiate themselves with believers to get close enough to bite. Then they say the false thing. We had two missionaries from Australia with our ministry. One in Australia was in a, on the council, and, but one was a missionary in Japan. I'd known this guy for some years. I found out that they believed something that they hid and kept secret until they had time to try to make a power play. They said that Jesus only completed his own work on the cross, not the work of salvation when he said he was finished. God the Father must come as a man and be crucified in Jerusalem, and the Holy Spirit must come as an incarnate man and be crucified in Jerusalem. And the two witnesses in Revelation 11 are the Father and the Holy Spirit. They also have to be crucified the way Jesus was to bring salvation. And then Jesus is their Lord. Now this is a version of an ancient heresy called Numapashianism and Patropashianism. There's nothing new under the sun, but I couldn't. These were people I knew. The doctrine was always right. They said they agreed with me. But sooner or later you'll find out. You'll always be able to identify the serpent. The question is, will you be able to identify the serpent before it bites? <laughs> it can be people you've known for years. Some time ago, I was confused when the laughing drunken thing happened in Toronto and Pensacola and all that garbage. I was saying, Lord... There are pastors, people I knew to be good and godly men who are going into something that is obviously not of you. It's a counterfeit revival. How can people I knew and always thought were solid be subscribing to this kind of deception and leading their congregations into it? I couldn't figure it out. The Lord said, and I don't hear from the Lord every five minutes, but I know what he told me. Stop being so naive, Jacob. When you see a pastor leaves his wife and children and runs off with the church secretary, and I've known cases where that's happened, and probably you do. Shameful, disgusting, outrageous, but it happens. He didn't wake up one day and decide to leave it the wife of his youth and his abandon his children and go off with the church secretary. There was something wrong with that guy for some time. There was something wrong with his relationship with God and with his wife for some time. It may have come to the surface, 
but there was something wrong there. When you see these people following obvious deceptions, like Taranta, the laughing drunken thing, and how can people... There's something wrong with him for some time. That serpent was there. They may have been saying true things. How can John MacArthur say you can worship the Antichrist, take the mark of the beast, worship the image of the beast, and still get saved and go to heaven in direct rejection and open contradiction to the word of God in Revelation chapter 14? How can John MacArthur say such a thing? There was something wrong with that guy all along. You don't come out with something like that overnight any more than you leave your wife and run off with a babe. It just doesn't work that way. But them snakes know how to hide until it's time to strike. When that time comes, have you charmed the snake? Well, we know what happened. Look at the book of Exodus, chapter 7, please. Verses 10 to 12. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did as the Lord had commanded. Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called for his wise men and the sorcerers. The New Testament identifies them as Jonathan John Bray's, as does Jewish history. And they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. Each one threw his staff, and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. <laughs> Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He did not listen to them as the Lord had said. A wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Scripturally, these signs follow. At least 1,000 times I have stated publicly that signs and wonders prove something about Jesus, the same vanilla oath, never about a man. It may be an indication he's from God, but it doesn't prove it. Pharaoh's magicians were able to counterfeit the miracles of Moses and Aaron, the way the Antichrist and false prophet are going to counterfeit the miracles of Jesus and his witnesses. Pretended signs and wonders doesn't necessarily mean it's leger de main, sleight of hand or a trick. It means the spiritual power on back of it is counterfeits. Now, of course, you've got these guys pulling the legs and all the doing the stupid stuff, but the Antichrist and false prophet, they're going to be demonically empowered to do supernatural things including astral phenomena. All signs and wonders, he must be from God. Remember, Jesus had healings, but he never had a healing crusade. He had miracles, but he never had a miracle crusade. He had a repentance crusade. Scripturally, these signs follow. He never allowed signs and wonders to be the focus of his message or his ministry. But the serpent seduces people. Only when Moses and Aaron threw their staff down, their serpent ate the other one. The only one who can outbox the devil is the Lord. Satan is astronomically not only smarter than any of us, he's smarter than all of us combined. He's the God of this world. The only one that can outmaneuver him, outcon him, is the Lord. Think of the crucifixion. He thought he won. 
If they knew God would raise him from the dead, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Check. No, checkmate. Only the Lord. can outsmart the devil. Only the Lord can outcon the con artist. He's just too slick. And he has a lot of experience. He's seducing the church much the same way he did Jesus. The Lord snake ate theirs. What hope do we have? In and of ourselves, we don't. Don't think you can handle deception and seduction. You can't. We can't. It's only the Lord. Hang on to the staff. It was that staff that was lifted up, that same staff that was lifted up where the Nehushtan was. That's the only hope. Otherwise, that serpent's going to bite you. Can you charm the serpent? Look with me, please, to the book of Amos, chapter 9. Verse 3, though they hide on the summit of Carmel, I'll search them out from there and take them from there, and though they conceal themselves from my sight on the floor of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it will bite them. The serpent is vicious and dangerous and cunning anyway. But when he has a mandate from God, as an instrument of divine judgment against the backslidden people who refuse to repent? <laughs> now the Lord is not going to protect you from the serpent. He's going to give you over to it. I'm not saying you or us or this church, but the people who Amos describes. And it's not just Israel. 1 Corinthians 10. It's the apostate church. Doesn't matter where they go. Mount Carmel looks like the Rock of Gibraltar. It's right next to the sea. It looks higher than it is because it's contrasted to sea level by virtue of its location. If you come with us to Israel, I'll bring you to Mount Carmel in April. doesn't matter if you go under the sea. Remember, one beast was from the earth in Revelation, one from the sea. doesn't matter. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. We are commanded, not exhorted, not encouraged. We are commanded to be as shrewd and as slick as the devil. You get a detective in a big city like New York or Chicago or L.A., what makes a detective different from an ordinary cop? A detective has learned to think like a criminal. <laughs> he, may not, <laughs> he may not be a criminal, but he knows how criminals think because he knows how to think like one. He understands the modus operandi. He understands what motivates them. He understands what they do, why they do it, and how they do it. He thinks the way they think. We're not called to be naive. We're called to be as shrewd as the serpent out to bite us. We are called to know how to charm the snake. Matthew chapter 23. How does the snake work? 
Matthew 23, verse 33. What did Jesus say to the Sanhedrin, to the corrupt religious leadership? You serpents, you brood of vipers, how shall you escape the sentence of hell? How will I not go to hell? Who? The religious leaders, the clergy who misled the people. The serpent works through the clergy who are no longer following Jesus on the basis of Scripture. Even though they can quote Scripture. Serpent is subtle. He beguiles the woman. Do you know how many people are sitting under the leadership, under the preaching of pastors and leaders who are serpents? The televangelists, con artists, they're obvious serpents. There's, there's ones in pulpits, all the, they're serpents. Bain, Diaclino. Right now, you need to be asking Jesus. I'm listening to Jacob Prash, Lord. Is this guy speaking from you? Or is he a serpent? Don't trust me. Don't trust me. You can trust the grace of Christ in me. If the Holy Spirit shows you it's the grace of Christ in me. But don't trust me. I'll tell you somebody else who not to trust. Don't trust you. We can only trust Jesus. Otherwise, that serpent is going to bite us. It's venom. It's poison. But in the last days, things get rather nasty. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. Verse 9, the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, deceives the whole world, was thrown down to earth, and his angels thrown down with him. His demon cohorts are coming down here. Verse 13, the dragon saw he was thrown down to earth and persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. This replays the nativity narrative, but it has to do with the end of the age. The woman was protected two times, time and a half time, from the presence of the serpent. But in verse 15, the serpent poured water out like a river. Notice the dragon and the serpent. They are the same beings. In Genesis, when the serpent was cursed, it was told it was going to crawl on its belly, remember? It was at least a biped, if not a quadruped. It had legs. Dinosaurs did not become extinct 65 million years ago. The dragon and the serpent are the same. Just two different modes of attack. But Satan has his combination punch. Left, right, left. Dragon, serpent, dragon. Persecution, deception, persecution. Boom, boom, boom. He's coming after the woman. The woman is the church. The woman is Israel. He's coming. And he's got his demon cohorts with him. That serpent pursues the woman. He works through the clergy. Distorts the scripture. Can even do miracles, signs, and wonders at times. Can even preach and say true things. This guy's good. Too good. Where's the diacrino? Where's the bain lachesh? Can you charm the serpent? 
the serpent, my friends, bites. There are whole churches being bitten by serpents. Venom. What is the ecumenical movement? The venom of the serpent. What is the word faith money preaches? The venom of the serpent. What is the new apostolic reformation so-called? The venom of the serpent. What is the purpose-driven lie and the global peace plan? The venom of the serpent. And it's biting a lot of Christians. Those who reject the word of God have rejected the Lord himself. The Lord will send those serpents. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. Serpent bites. But he can be charmed. You have to know how to charm the serpent before he bites. Ecclesiastes tells. Forget about it once again. No use bolting the barn door after the horse escapes. Proverbially. You've got to know how to charm the serpent before he bites. That's the bad news. The good news is the nechushtam. Is the lachesh is the whispered incantation. Jesus, don't let me be misled. Remember, he warned about wars one time, rumors of war one time, the Jews returning to Jerusalem one time, famines one time, pestilence one time, an increase in earthquakes and seismic activity one time. One time, one time, one time, one time, one time, one time. He warned about deception perpetrated against the elect four times. He warned about spiritual seduction four times more than he did anything else. Do you know the incantation? Do you want to have your ears tickled? Or do you know how to charm the snake? That snake has bitten many believers. There are people running crazy in the church. I had a friend who was a Baptist missionary from the American South when I lived in Israel. I was a lay missionary to the Jews. He was a missionary to the Arabs. But we were friends. We were just buddies, I guess. We had fellowship. We used to pray together and hang out in that end. He would talk to me about Arab work and witnessing to Muslims, and I'd talk about it to him about evangelizing Jews and things like that. We'd hang out. But there was a, I wouldn't call it a love-hate relationship. There was like a mutual pretended antagonism because I was from New York and he was from the Bible Belt. And I, he'd call me a Yankee, and I'd call him a rebel. You know, the Mason-Dixon line. It was that kind of, you know. And he told me one time about these people in Appalachia that he knew about that picked up snakes in their church. <laughs> and I thought, you know, he was joking. I thought he was just poking fun at me because I was from New York. This Yankee will believe anything, you know. It's because we used to clown around a lot. I thought it was just the usual goofing off, you know, guys goofing off. We did. But then I found out he wasn't joking. There's people who are actually that nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise the Lord, brethren. Do you know the Lord Jesus? Well, yes, I came to know Christ when I was in university. You say you're saved. Yeah, well, the Lord saved me. Have you had the test of faith yet? <laughs> well, Burr, you say you're a Christian. But we'll just find out. Well, Burr, we have a man here who claims to be saved. 
Will you bring the sack, please? <laughs> they really do this. They're nuts. I thought my friend, was, his name is David Grossclaw, I thought he was goofing on me. I thought he was <laughs> pulling my leg with <laughs> He wasn't. They really do it. And they get it from misreading Mark's version of the Great Commission at the end of Mark's Gospel. Now, some manuscripts, early manuscripts, don't even contain it. Verse 18, they will pick up serpents and drink deadly poison. Now, I believe it is canonical. I believe it's in there, but not the way they think. The reason I believe it's canonical is not just based on the manuscript evidence. That can be debated. But I believe it's canonical because you have a precedent for it in the book of Acts. Look with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 28. We deal with this in the book, Carpezzo. When they were brought safely, verse 1, through, safely through, we found that the island was called Malta, and the natives showed us extraordinary kindness. For because of the rain that had set in, and because of the cold, they kindled the fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. And then the natives saw the creature hanging on his hand and began saying to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer. And though he's been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. Now, he didn't tempt the Lord. He didn't pick the snake up. But you understand, it's in the book, typologically. It's a picture. Remember the, the serpent that's cast into the fire in the book of Revelation? It's a picture of the judgment of Satan. He could charm the snake. The snake goes in the fire. He knew how to do it. But we have to know how to do it. Snake is real. He comes out of the fire. He goes back to the fire. But he bites. Can you charm the snake? Do you have by in lechish? Discernment. Do you know the whispered incantation? If you can't charm that snake, that snake is going to bite you, and that venom is deadly. Yes, friends, that snake bites. That snake bites. But the Lord wants you to know how to charm it before it does bite you. Every one of us, we all desperately need to understand that we have to charm the snake. It bites. It kills. But if you can charm it, it won't kill you. God bless.